Welcome to the Connected Enterprise Podcast. This is Carl Lewis, your host from Vision 33. Uh, my guest today is Jeff Scott from ASA. Uh, Jeff is always a great guest because he sees and talks to so many customers uh, that he's just he's got a wealth of knowledge and you know what people are doing and thinking, and that's really why I invited him. Jeff, uh, welcome back to the podcast after a couple of years here. Carl, great to see you as always. You and I are. Uh... Our collaboration goes back many, many years, so it's wonderful to see you, even if it's virtually. I still remember, uh, you know, you were on the board of ASUG and uh, in California at the time, as I yeah. was, and uh, we had lunch together one day. And I remember it. Many, many years ago now. and uh, a great Too many to ago. count, my friend, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I stopped. <laughs> <laughs> well, back, when you, back when you and I were both living in Los Angeles, in the Los Angeles area, which neither of us are anymore, so nope, that kind of tells you how, how long it's been. I think it was temporary for both of us. Uh, it was. That was yeah, it was. absolutely. Um, well, Jeff, tell us a little bit about ASUG and, and your role and the kind of things you're doing before we get started today. Well, Carl, you know, ASUG is the America's SAP Users Group. We are the North American version of a user community that's really here to help organizations and individuals get the most out of their investment in SAP. So what we really do is we want to make sure that organizations understand how to use the software, how to make sure that they're getting value from it. And then also how we as individuals, you know, work inside this ecosystem and make wonderful careers from everything we do inside of SAP. And just like you, you and I have been, and with so many others, part of this ecosystem for a long, long time. And when I use that word ecosystem, I mean, you know, SAP, the customers and the partners like Vision 33 together, right? And it's really that strength of ecosystem that creates gravitational pull that prevents people like you and I from escaping, but also brings other people in. And I think that's the strength of, of a really strong community is our ability to inspire people to come on in and be part of this SAP community and, and do amazing things and have great careers and solve business problems and do all those things. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I constantly see uh, interns that are getting job and some SAP yeah. uh, partner or at SAP directly. And uh, so that that has been a, a great thing through the years. And I know ASUC has been a big part of why that's happened. Um, I think it's critical for us to think about this in broader strokes, right? Keeping this ecosystem strong is really important for the partners like you at Vision 33. You want a strong and deep customer base for a long time. Customers want to make sure that they have a technology and a product that they can trust over a long period of time, because you and I both know that Investments in this technology are not insubstantial. They can they can be they can be expensive. They can take a lot of time and energy and effort and passion, and we want that to be around for a long time because we we need to measure the payoff in in not just months but in in years if not decades. Yeah, exactly. Uh, these days, you know, you make an investment that's significant in software. You don't want to have to do it again anytime no. soon. Uh, not so with the stuff you and I play with. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. How. Uh, how are these organizations uh, preparing for the potential of what we hope is never going to happen, uh, another pandemic? Mm. You know, but Carl, I think we've learned uh, that things are changing, um, you know, but there's that old adage, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And I think what we've learned is that you can substitute in other words from a pandemic and you end up at the same point. You can now say global uncertainty, you know, if you think about the horrifying war in, in between Russia and Ukraine. You can think about supply chain disruptions. You know, you can think about economic disruptions. And so I think what we're learning is, you know, back when the pandemic started, we kind of said, oh, we, we just get through this, things will get better. You know, if we can just get over the next year, we'll, we'll get back to the way things used to be. And, you know, if we just get over this hurdle, we'll be better. And I think what we're learning is we get over one hurdle and just come face to face and smack into another one. And so I think that really requires us as customers and partners and SAP take a much longer view of what's happening in our society, what's happening in our economies, and prepare for that, which I think you know really gives the rise to the concept of a resilient supply chain or resilient organization versus one that just tries to get through the storm. Yeah, you know, uh, the, those, uh, those crazy people that actually run over hurdles, they don't get to run over just one. Right. They don't. And you it's just, you know, yeah, of it's a whole lot of them. And I think we've got to get better at that. And, you know, and I'm, but for a moment, I'm not taking away how exhausted this community is. Right. We've been through a lot over the past couple of years. Um, and, you know, by no means, you know, we've barely caught our breath. We're still breathing hard. And now it's on for, the, you know, the next thing to do. So, you, you know, one of the things you and I spoke about, you know, before we got together today and recorded this is, you know, what does ASIC data say? 
And data, ASIC data says something really important. It says that um, you know, 57 percent of respondents indicated they were moving forward with their plan initiatives as normal throughout the pandemic. And so what that tells me is that there was already a strong base that said, regardless of the outcome, we have to keep moving forward. We have to keep pressing forward. We got to figure out how to get this done. And I think that, you know, but of that 57 percent, that means roughly 30 percent delayed. And the problem, I think, with delaying is they're now going to recognize that ugh, we're just a little further behind. Right. I didn't I didn't stay steady during the pandemic. I actually got behind. And, you know, the pandemic, I think, also taught us that automation and, you know, digitization and digital transformation, all those buzzwords that we've been banding about for so long, actually do have meaning. They actually say that this is stuff that has to be taken care of, because I think both you and I recognize it. As I know Vision 33 certainly does, yeah. that we live in a transformed world post-pandemic, right? Um, people are much more ready to be communicating on digital platforms, conducting business digitally, then it fundamentally changes how our businesses go to market. Yeah, absolutely. And Jeff, you mentioned the supply chain a couple of times. What what kind of changes do you see people making to cause the supply chain to be more resilient for the future? Yeah, well, I think, you know, uh, the first place I think about if we look at SAP is the business network um, and how the business network is being used to really digitize supply chains, allowing people to put their products up in a global marketplace that's available digitally and how it brings buyers and sellers together, right? And there's some certain advantages to that. I think that most companies should look at the at the business network and, and look at that with a very strong eye and say, you know, maybe this is a way for me to find products and find suppliers that can help, you know, diversify my supply chain when I'm, you know, on the input side. On the output side, you know, when global disruption occurs and, and maybe you're not selling or there's a there's a recession, maybe it opens yourself up to customers you hadn't thought of before. And I think those are some of the things uh, I think that can happen. Um, you know, and when you talk about, you know, where do we go with this? I, I think, you know, everyone's talking about it. You know, KPMG said that uh, logistics disruption is the number one thing impacting global supply chains in 2022. Um, you know, Event Watch, which is an artificial intelligence organization, um, said that, you know, the number of supply chain disruptions increased dramatically over the last couple of years, right? So when we think about that, you know, they're doubling every year according to EventWatch AI, right? Mm -hmm. So what this tells us is this isn't, this isn't just, a, again, where you and I started, it's not just a single hurdle to get over. We just got to get better at doing it, right? Yeah. And we've got to get better at understanding how all these things are going to work um, and how we actually get ahead of them. And so I think, you know, we talked about business networks. Uh, we talked about understanding that technology is going to be the epicenter of how we solve these problems. Um, you know, that our ability to have really good internal systems that can manage our supply chains, that can understand when things don't look right, who can help us with quality concerns, can automate are really how the modern organization is going to win. Right, right. You know, people talk about recession, but what I wonder about is, is this recession, if we're in a recession or on the verge of recession mm. or whatever, because um, I don't think anybody's made up their mind completely about it. No. Is it driven by, you know, the supply side or demand or both? Or what's mm. what's kind of causing us to be in this, I'll call it the precipice of recession? <laughs> yeah, well, we're, or, or are we, right? To your point, are yeah. we, right? And, and depending on when you pick up the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, or your periodical of choice, or your newspaper of choice, you get very conflicting answers, which yeah. I, I think, again, speaks to this notion that uh, we live in a, in a markedly different time, that these 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 markers that we, we march to are a little fuzzier than they used to be. So, you know, I, I think there's some parts of our, our you know, our economy that are definitely feeling a pain and there's other parts that are still chugging forward like always um you know so i i think that you know what we have to look at is you know it's a little bit of both right that you know it is a little bit of supply being constrained which is driving prices up right and and trying to cool that off um and in areas where demand might have moved um you know uh, and you know I, I think it's moving much faster Right. I think it's moving much faster than it ever has before. 
I think digitization is both a cause and an effect, right? It's a cause in the sense that in order to remain competitive, you have to digitize more. But as you digitize more, you find that speed becomes and, and we accelerate even faster and things move around much quicker. You know, I mean, think about our buying habits today and the difference in speed uh, between jumping in a, in a vehicle, hopefully, you know, soon to be, you know, a, a battery powered an EV, right? There's a lot of change in that industry. And, you know, and going to a store versus ordering something through Amazon or Walmart. I mean, the ability for you to have things delivered in a delivery economy versus one that caused you to get into a vehicle or go out on foot and, and, and buy your products dramatically changes everything. Um, and it moves the economy along at a much faster scale. For sure. E even though there are those of us like myself who still like that daily or, or daily opportunity to get away from the desk, right? So yeah, uh, or an opportunity to drive my classic car, one or the other. Um, <laughs> now, did you ever think you'd call it a classic car, Carl? Did you ever? Uh, that, that by the way, classic car, Carl. There's there's a there's a tongue twister for you. Yeah, there it is. Um, uh, well, uh, you know, it's a 1965, so I I'm going to mm, call that classic. But that is uh, a classic, and and it's an old El Camino, so uh, it's, oh, uh, nice. it's pretty pretty fun. Um, What's what are the remaining challenges, Jeff, that you see businesses facing, you know, kind of as the the, the aftermath of, of a pandemic, even those that handled it well? And there were a lot of them, as, you, as we know. But what what are they mm -hmm. left challenged, challenged with for the future? Yeah, I think, you know, you and I've spent a lot of the first moments of this podcast talking about economics and supply chains. Right. But to me, the biggest challenge that we face is skills. Right. That the skills that we are needing today to solve our business problems are radically different than what we needed a year or two years ago. So to me, it's about teams. Right. We, we've heard a lot about the great resignation. We've heard a lot about people's changing in priorities, um, a lot about, you know, how much productive effort employees really want to give. So to me, it's the skills piece that is the critical piece uh, of the puzzle that needs to be solved. It is also something that tells me that we have to be much better at giving our people who do technology a place to call home and to feel like they're value added contributors and not just cogs in a wheel. Um, and I think you know all of us as leaders have lessons to learn about how do we think about inclusive workplaces? How do we inspire people to stay? versus encouraging them to go. Um, and we need a highly animated, highly engaged, highly collaborative learning organization if we're going to succeed in the future, especially around all this technology that you and I are talking about, right? It requires us to learn a lot of skills. And, you know, I, I think that the technology landscape has gotten more complex over the past couple of years than it's got, gotten simpler. And, and you and I started our careers a few years ago. Um, so, you know, I kind of look back at my early days in technology and think about, you know, wow, that was really simple back then. I wish I could go back to doing, you know, uh, oh, goodness, Carl, I'm going to date myself here. But, you know, life was simpler when you had 80 columns and 24 rows, right? Yes. And you yeah. didn't have to worry about graphical user interfaces. You just had to make sure you painted a screen and fields, you know, didn't require special characters and, and all those other things. And, Programming languages were a little bit older, but a little bit more, you know, easier to deal with. And, you know, you kind of, you know, I, I like to dabble in, in computer programming. And, you know, that's harder today. You got to learn a lot more skills. And then you get some of the hyperscalers involved. And, you know, all these things are available online and digital. Yeah, there's a huge skill demand for all of that. So I think that becomes a really big thing. And then so how do you, once you find these amazing people that can really advance your business, how do you keep them? How do you keep them engaged? How do you keep them helping, right? Um, and how do you make sure that they're really there? So I, I think I think you know skills and people and teams is the number one thing we should spend a lot more time at. And as technologists, we like to talk about tech, but you know at, at the at the at, underneath all that tech are a lot of people making it work. Um, yeah. And I think that becomes you know uh, important. I think the other challenge is you know that this happening. So at the same time we're talking about tech. It also requires that the skill shortages are not just happening, uh, you know, in the technology organizations. They're happening, you know, in the plants. They're happening in the distribution centers. They're happening in the back offices. And that skill base has left. So those people who used to know how to use all of this technology have disappeared. 
And what used to be handed down from from you know from mouth to mouth to mouth about how you got stuff done, you know, using you know any myriad of different systems has evaporated. And so we as technologists find ourselves having to reskill and reteach lines of business individuals how to use these tools. Um, and and I think that requires a huge reinvestment. So you know I think all of that you know then then opens up the the, the perspective of you know process automation. And you know AI and auto, you know AI and RPA and all these other acronyms that are flying around, which are really about using technology to help technology solve technology problems. Um, and I think that's really where the next phase of this really needs to be: is how do we work on better automation tools that automate what we do every day in a in a way that doesn't require lots of hands to be in the middle of it? Yeah. I mean, you know, you and I have been in the middle of lots of integration projects. Right, that require a lot of a lot of people time and hours to do. Imagine how amazing it would be if you could actually have computers do some of that. Yeah, for sure. You know, one of those uh, important leaders, team members, uh, are CIOs. Mm. With all of the change that we've seen, even in the last ten years, with technology, how how has the role of that particular team member changed? Yeah, I mean, it all it all comes to the CIO, right? If the CIO is the lead technologist in the organization, one, how do he or she, she or he, inspire a team to move forward? I think their ability to influence the technology decisions of the organization is greater. Do they want to be order takers or do they want to be strategists at the table thinking about how technology can transform that business? I think that is incredibly important. You know, I, I think they need to be better business partners. I mean, a lot of people have been invited to the table, right? You know, when we think about the ability of the technology people to be at the table helping solve business problems, I think that's a critical enabler. Um, and, you know, I think that if, if all we're going to do as technologists is talk about technology and not talk about the broader way that that technology solves key organizational issues, much like human resources solves people problems, much like the way that sales solves sales and top line problems. The technology runs through all of it. And I think these individuals, CIOs need to be at the table more, which means they have to earn their place there, which means that they have to be willing to have those conversations, be willing to, to not live and die by project timelines and, and be seen as tactical, but really be seen as, as, as leading broader strategies. It's interesting. That's really interesting because I suppose in, in my lifetime, uh, that's not what we thought, you know, a, no. a technologist would do. They would be more uh, off in their own little corner of the building, not really engaged with others, you know, just uh, taking care of the stuff. Um, yeah. And now we were supposed to be the ones walking around. I mean, remember the early days of computing and the, the age old, you know, movies we see and they're all in their white lab coats. Yeah. Right. And and that doesn't inspire a strategic view that inspires someone who's out there turning wrenches and, you know, and screws. And I, I'm not for a moment discounting those aren't incredibly important, but I think the ability to have forward conversations is really where it needs to be, which is why the ASUG executive exchange for those who are listening today, who are members of ASUG. And if you're not, I'm going to ask you why you aren't, because it's the most <laughs> important part of the ecosystem, as you've already admitted, Carl. But and if you, you know, take the next step up, if you're a, if you're a senior leader. And you're making decisions about, you know, what technologies you want to purchase and deploy, or how to make them better, or, or how to fit into a an enterprise architecture, how to make all the pieces fit. The ASIC Executive Exchange community is the right place for you, right? The ability for all of you to to kind of come together as decision makers and senior leaders and talk about some of these foundational challenges. Um, I think we as as ASIC Executive Exchange can do a better job not only talking about the bits and bytes, but talking about key leadership skills that are required to be successful with your line of business peers, to be successful as a leader of, of teams, uh, those kind of critical skills become just as important as well. Yeah, for sure. Uh, they definitely do. Uh, to, that that is, role has changed dramatically, for sure. How about, uh, I mean, what is software and technology? We sort of bundle them into, into one these days. I think we used to think of them as very separate, sort of, you know, like the hardware and the software, but really they're one mm -hmm. entity anymore. What's kind of changed the experience over the past two years? How are those things working mm. better together, right, to uh, to enhance organizations? What have you seen, you know, occur, and especially with SAP, of course? Well, I, I mean, you you just alluded to it, right? There is a whole scale shift 
away from individuals wanting to have data centers um, or data closets filled with servers um, that are managed and maintained by an internal team. Um, so the idea of the of the hyperscaler is is, is you know candidly is here to stay. Um, you know most organizations are, are finding it increasingly difficult to staff the skills required to to manage hardware day in day out. And if you're spending as a CIO a big chunk of your budget and time and people dedicated to hardware management and maintenance. You know, um, I, I would encourage you to move quickly to moving things to an outsourced world because I just I think keeping those skills engaged is going to be incredibly challenging. Um, one, they're in short supply, and two, they're being gobbled up by all the hyperscalers who can provide them much richer career paths. So, I mean, that to me is a skill set that you know you're really going to struggle with. So, you know, on the flip side, so you know, in, instead of fighting the tide, join it. Um, and think about how you want to utilize cloud infrastructure and, and cloud compute to get to where your business needs to be. Um, and I think so cloud is, is, is one major area where I think people need to focus. Um, I, I think that at the end of the day, Carl, uh, technologists like you and I and the people that are listening today, our organizations want us to provide solutions, not talk about cloud, not talk about the how. The how is up to us. We we can do that internally, but really talk about the why. How why do we want to make things move faster? Why do we want to do this? Why do we want to do that? You know, how do we as an organization become more digital? How do we move at a faster pace? How do we make sure we're resilient in our supply chains? Those are those are much higher order things that I think uh, people can can look at. So um, you know, I think organizations like Vision Thirty Three do a brilliant job of of making sure that organizations are poised to be able to, to combat all of the issues that are gonna come flying at them day in, day out. So I, I think that, you know, for, for us that, you know, it's it's about, uh, you know, all these technologies moving in lockstep to drive a better business outcome. And, and unfortunately for all of us who are working inside organizations, the buying choices are much more complicated, the, the tools in, uh, that, are, that are offered are much more complicated you know, instead of being able to pick two or three, you can pick 30. And so enterprise architecture becomes a lot more critical to, to most organizations. Make the right picks. Um, and, and while we'd like to believe that in this new world of cloud and, you know, subscription-based architectures, that, hey, if it doesn't work, I can just turn it off. It's not quite that, it's not quite that simple, is it, really? I mean, you know, one, what do you do with the data? And two, you know, you've now just orphaned a solution. And, and so you spend a lot of time in enterprise architecture trying to make the right choice and unfortunately trying to undo the wrong ones. Yeah. Um, and once these things get in your organization, they're really hard to get out. And, uh, you know, I think it's become a lot easier for people to pick the solution of choice. There's a lot of line of business people out there who can buy solutions on a credit card. And they can probably do it, you know, right under the, the nose of the technology team. But sometimes, sometimes, not always, sometimes that doesn't necessarily fit into the broader, you know, enterprise architecture. Yeah. And you and I, but certainly in, in many cases where you, you wake up one day and you walk into a room and you say, you're using what? Where, <laughs> where did that come from? Right. right. And someone says, my credit card. I put it on my credit card and now here we go. And you're like, oh, goodness. Um, how are we supposed to work with that? And, and, and they don't buy it and hate it. They buy it and love it. And they want everyone else to adopt it. So you have a yep. bunch of, you know, rabid adoption fans running all over the organization who think they know technology as well as the technologists do. Yeah. Um, so I, I think, you know, all of that plays into, into in, you know, into the whole picture. And you and I already have talked about all the other things. We talked about cloud. We talked about artificial intelligence. We've talked about RPA. You know, we can we could throw, a, you know, a list of five or six uh, acronyms around that that all just fit into the mix as well. Yeah, for sure. So um, <clears throat> what comes next for SAP customers? Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think what comes next, right? We've talked about the ecosystem, the strength of the ecosystem, standardizing business processes. When we do ASUG research, business process standardization is top of the list, right? I think most organizations now are saying, you know what? We're, you know, most of us, our, our secret sauce is not our ability to do accounts payable or receivables, right? That's, that's not how we're going to, you know, succeed in life. So to the extent that we can standardize processes and rely on SAP to provide world-class processes to us that we can just adopt 
versus spend a lot of time arguing about and modifying? Can you provide us those processes and just let us take, take the worry out? So I think that's big. Standardizing processes, we've covered automation, dashboarding and analytics continue to be top of the list, right? In a digitized world, we should be able to really understand how our businesses are operating at every point in time. And so our ability to have really good dashboards that give us a good insight into how the business is really performing become critical. Integration, you and I've talked about, you know, everyone has their favorite app of choice. Um, some organizations have hundreds of them. Uh, how do you integrate them all together? Um, yep. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, we all talk about integration, but it's the area where we stumble the most. It's it's the one constant that I've seen across our ecosystem, you know, since I had the privilege of, of leading ASUG almost nine years ago. Integration has never stopped being a top of the talking block. Um, and, and it will always be there as long as we willy-nilly implement lots of different solutions. Yeah, for sure. S sustainability has become a really big topic over the last year or so, Carl. And, and when we first started it here in North America, I was skeptical. Um, you know, I thought that uh, my European counterparts were were, you know, you know, I said, we in North America are not that interested in sustainability. And I've been proven wrong um, that we are very interested in sustainability here. And I, I think that sustainability has a lot of applicability. So for those in, in organizations that are listening today who are not thinking about sustainability, I, I encourage you to really think about it because it's coming to your to your front yard. Um, yeah. And the more we can have technology tools that help drive that and, and help report on it. And, and to me, it's not just about, you know, how you make your your manufacturing operations more sustainable or your services more sustainable. I mean, there's amazing ideas there. How do you make your IT operations more sustainable, right? Do you really have to write the same, you know, write code from scratch every time? How do you reuse? How do you, how do you think about less being more? And then finally change management. I mean, I think, you know, integration and change management and sustainability go hand in hand. That was a long list of like one, two, three, four, five, six things. I think I gave you. <laughs> That's all right. You and I could probably do an hour long podcast in each of them. Should we start? Oh now? yeah, so especially integration. I, that's uh, always a fun topic. So we yeah, do. I mean, it's, I think it's where Vision Thirty Three spends a tremendous amount of its time, if I'm not we mistaken, do. right? We do. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it's uh, it's definitely sort of I think the the edge of everything right now, right? Yeah, the Achilles seal of a lot of this. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, when it isn't right, organizations make foundational missteps and things yes. things go wrong. And I think, you know, what we're learning at the very part, top of the conversation today, when you were speaking about, you know, broad economics and, 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 and supply chain resilience, the ability, the, the margin of error that we play with in today's, you know, modern businesses is really small. So yeah. when integration misfires, it could have some significant and substantial side effects that uh, yeah. can be very unhealthy. Yeah, massive, massive. massive. It's 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 automated. It's quick, and then when it's bad, it gets real bad real fast. Real right. bad, real fast. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and uh, gets it's hard to recover uh, mm. when that occurs for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jeff, we're we're going to see each other again for in a couple weeks. In, yeah, in in the fall here in a few more weeks. Uh, it's. Uh, the uh, the name has changed, but the, you know the the meeting and the people are all still going to be be there. So look forward to that, my friend. Yeah, I, mid market uh, SAP uh, and ASUG um, coming together to do the uh, SAP mid market conference October yep. the fourth through the sixth in yep. Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, yeah. So if, if you know, come for the conference, stay for the bourbon, I suppose. Um, <laughs> you know, yep. um, which which we all love at the moment. Um, but, you know, the ability for mid-market organizations to talk to one another, you know, when, when I think about the, the broad ASUG community, the area where I think we have the most impact is in mid-market. Um, you know, the, the biggies of the big have a lot of this figured out. Um, they've been doing it for a long time. They have deeper budgets. They have bigger pockets, whatever. The mid-market organizations coming together to learn, connect, and grow. Those are the three foundational pillars of ASUG. We want to make sure you learn. We want to make sure you understand all the options that are available to you. We want to make sure you're talking to your peers. You're understanding what everyone else is doing. And not from a competitive way. We're not just instilling each other's competitive secrets. But the more we learn from each other about how these technologies are driving really important business transformation, the better we are. To, and it prevents mistakes. You and I just spent a lot of time talking about margin of error. You know, yeah. we still are surrounded by really big projects that cost a lot of money that don't have the breadth and depth to, to make mistakes. Yeah. So the more, the better we are at that, the better off we all are. So learn, that's the connect and then grow, grow your professional careers. 
right? Learn learn how to be part of this ecosystem and give back a little bit, I think is is really important. That's what I would say, Carl. Yeah, well, as you know, I've always been a big fan and uh, huge I'm looking fan. forward to being there myself. And you've been a huge voice of this community for a long time. And you know, I can't thank you enough for everything that you've done to, to propel us forward. So when I talk about ecosystem, you're you're one of the you're one of the points of light, my friend. Well, it's uh, doing all these things has definitely uh, added value to my career, my experience. If the uh, ASUG's been a big part of creating almost like a personal brand for me, so I uh, yeah, I uh, I'm grateful, and it's been a great relationship. I encourage everyone to uh, participate. Well, I think altogether we make the ecosystem stronger, and as you and I talked about at the top of this, you know, creating gravitational pull, which brings more in and yep. prevents people like you and I from from you know jettisoning out. Can't get out now. <laughs> nope, nope. <laughs> too We're much fun good. to stay. It's too well, much my fun friend, to thanks, thanks so much thanks for joining Carlos. me again for this. Uh, really appreciate it, Jeff. And uh, pleasure. Look forward to see you pleasure. Thank you. See yeah. you in a few weeks. Absolutely. And for everyone else, until we meet again, stay connected.